Okay, so Dean, who is the person who starts? Who's the first one? I'm gonna have to have the person tell me because <laughs> I honestly can't remember. I think it's, I th thought it was Rita, but I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to start, but I don't know. Maybe there was somebody in front of me. I don't know. Oh, that's me. Okay. So uh, I'll start with the painting on the left. Paul oh, wait, wait a second. Wait a second. What did we, what did we do? Oh, we did the thing. We did the thing with that line at the very top. Oh, take that away. Yeah, you have to go to the- Oh, yeah. At yeah. the very top, the okay. first horizontal line you have to clip. Right. You mean the one in green? Mine, like mine a minus went sign. Away. Mine went yeah. away. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about one in uh, something in dreams as you were viewing Dean Johnson's screen? No. Oh. Next, it could be next to that though. It says view options. Mm -hmm. If you want to move the column of our, you know, our images, you could just drag and drop it to the bottom. That's what I did. And then it won't obscure any of the work. Oh, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. That's nice. That's nice. Okay. Okay. So, so um, I'd like to start because I want to make sure that everyone goes and, um, and if you could keep it to four to five minutes, something like that. And um, I also, before we start uh, with Rita, I just want to remind you to send me two images of Diane Arbus ah. for, for next week, for next week. Um, hmm. So uh, Rita, Rita, could you start then? Certainly. So the subject is the artist's studio. My first choice is Paul Rigo, the artist in her studio. Passionate, vibrant, commanding, even in a moment of repose, she smokes her pipe and stomps her thick boots and spreads her legs under a brilliantly colored skirt in a stance of power, her art scattered casually about her. Paula Rigo marks her territory. This is her blue eyed fortress where she is a purple and crimson queen. Her safe house in a world otherwise dominated by male artists and male art critics. This is where the muses regularly visit. This is her world of magical thing, where a female artist can follow her bliss while goddesses and creatures of ancient myth surround her protectively. She sits on her throne and directs the show. In her studio, there is vitality and a never ceasing celebration of art. Within these protective walls is her freedom. Within, she flourishes. She populates her space with her fecund imagination. Black canvases do not scare her. She has more vision than she has canvas on which to paint. Polar Rigo Studio, let us call it a room of her own. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes. Well and, done, uh, well done. The next choice is of the artist studio is an artist named Simon Dinerstein, <laughs> the full <laughs> An artist studio, his inner sanctum. I wonder if the mystery of his process of creation itself shall be here revealed. I wonder if the secrets shall be hidden in plain sight as I unfold the panels of a triptych and enter the room where it happens. I search to understand the miracle 
by which a dauntingly empty three panel wood canvas magically becomes the repository of those secrets. There are tantalizing clues, a child's scrawl, fragments of transformational art, snippets of writing, even a quote from the great novel Moby Dick. And I quote, to me, the white whale is that wall shoved near to me. Sometimes I think there's naught beyond, unquote. I read it and I feel the artist's existential dread, even if fleeting, when the flat white wood wall confronts him. Can he conquer it? Will inspiration hold? Can he break through the wall to the next dimension or will it break him? Will his quest fail? Will it all come to naught? In awe of that primordial blank expanse, that white whale whose challenge must be met, Simon Dinerstein orders the nothingness with his finely honed weapons and his penetrating vision. He precisely, bravely, relentlessly anoints the void with oil, with meaning, with textures and lines and geometric shapes, inserting heritage and humanity and philosophy within the geometry. He organizes our gaze as he has organized his studio, as he has organized his triptych, as he has organized his creative force. A triptych's tradition of spiritual adoration is also here. Reverence for the Holy Trinity of Simon's family, for the rich classical artistic past to which he is heir and which inspires him, for the rectangular mementos of mundane existence which give him daily sustenance. I lift each miniature pinned up homage to the simple and profound in art and in life, to past and present, in order to peer through the wormholes beneath and unmask the triptych's truth. I pry open the studio's painted windows to look past the blue horizon. I search in vain for brushes and paints among those meticulously aligned dark pools which carve enigmatic patterns into a copper plate. Composed, eyes focused, princely in his blue velvet, humble in his work boots, balanced by his love of family and love of art, the artist beckons us through the event horizon of that mystical glowing gold leaf copper portal at the center of it all, to the dimensions beyond the studio, where past, present, and future exist all at once, where the invisible map of artistic creation is etched, waiting still to be revealed. Well, that, that's uh, simply amazing. Um... <clears throat> I, I'd like to have a copy of that, if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I have to think, of, I have to think about all of that. So, uh, but Rita, it's right up there. Thank you. Really. Um, Very uh, nice. Always nice. <laughs> yeah, really, really well done. Um, yeah. Uh, I like the part about um, Puerto Rico. She marks her territory where the muses regularly visit. Within these walls is her freedom, a room of her own. A room yeah. of her own. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Very, very well done. Very well done. Um, uh, it's, it's a little awkward because I'm the person you're writing about. <laughs> yes. But, um, but um, it's it's very striking. Um, um, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Dean, the next the next one. That's me, Lucy. Oh, Lucy, go ahead. 
Okay, I'm going to only talk about uh, the Keita Kolvitz. One, because I got too interested in her life and um, uh, Balthus couldn't be more different. And I think it's, I mean, to talk about him is just, there's not enough time. So uh, I should say that I mean, you can see the huge difference right there. The fact that she's uh, an etching, hers is an etching, and his is a painting. And the thing that struck me about that, even though I'm not that impressed with his art generally, uh, I like this, or I thought this was an interesting painting because of the way he used light and the way his collar pops out at you. Well because said. The well, colors so. are very subdued and they're quite related. But uh, anyway, that's about all I have to say about him. Can, can I ask you, yeah. I, I don't mean to get you off track, but can I ask you, did you know Colvitz before the class? Yes, I did. Okay, good, good. I took, when I was in college at Oberlin years ago, I took a class on uh, printmaking. Oh. Okay. And they had a really terrific art department there. I, I assume they still do. But anyway, this was one of the, uh, not this particular image, but she was definitely one of the people we studied. So what do you have to say about Colvitz? Well, um, I should probably read a little bit here. Yeah, go, um, ahead. go ahead. She... Uh, she was born in 1867, and her father was a radical social democrat. Her mother was the daughter of a, a Lutheran pastor who was expelled from the evangel evangelical state church. Her parents encouraged her to study, and eventually uh, she went to Munich and realized her art strength was as a draftsman instead of a painter. She married Karl Kolwitz, who was a medical student who became a doctor in Berlin, serving the poor. They lived in a large apartment where he saw his patients and she had her studio. This living arrangement gave her access to seeing poor working class patients whom she considered to be beautiful. Uh, I should go on, I think um, at some point, uh, she was a committed socialist and pacifist who lost her son in World War II and her grandson in World War, World War I, her son in World War I, her grandson in World War II. She was a very highly regarded artist and uh, had several important teaching positions which were taken away by the Nazis. She and her husband were visited by the Gestapo in 1936, who threatened to deport them to a concentration camp. The couple resolved to commit suicide if that happened. However, she was now an important international figure and there was no further action. Okay, so this particular uh, etching, it's an etching and dry point, and I'm not sure what dry point is, but... Uh, Dry point, is, dry point is, is drawing with a very sharp instrument. And it's a line that is not as strong as an etched line. It's slightly fuzzier, uh -huh. but, okay. but it, it's just drawing directly on the plate. Okay. All right, I have another question. Uh, when you're preparing to do an etching, do you draw it? Draw what you're going to put on the plate? before, or you just do it all on the plate? No, no, you, it, you draw, but you see the dry point makes a pressure. So the pressure makes an incised line. Yes. With, I, with, I, etching, I, with etching, you don't make an incised line. You're just taking with your scriber, you're taking away a little bit of the surface. Mm -hmm. So then at some future point, um, you're putting the plate into acid and the acid 
eats into the lines that you draw. So the acid, the acid is doing the work that the dry point does. Okay. Well, I, my question is, does one tend to do the image for the first time on the plate or do you do a practice drawing? Um, that varies. Oh. That varies up, upon the artist. Um, I have done some uh, uh, engravings and etchings and they came from drawings that I did. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they came from a, a primary source to an etching. Mm -hmm. um, it could be done that way, or it could be done directly on the plate. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, there's no way to know, I guess, how she did this, but whatever she did, it's very powerful. <clears throat> this, I, I believe this was done directly on the plate. Uh -huh. Okay, it's from 1910. <clears throat> before she was coping with the Nazis and before her son had died. But yeah. it certainly is an intense picture. She was 43 in 1910. And she was very interested in concentrating on face and hands. She didn't do any other portraits except self portraits. She did uh, 50 of them. And, um, but she was very interested in the hands. And um, she, this perhaps came from the fact that she admired the works of old masters such as Albrecht Dürer, uh, who she had studied. And she wrote in her personal journal, only the total attitude and the face and hands speak to me. That was an entry in 1919. <clears throat> so um, the things I have thought about as I look at this amazing picture, it very especially amazing to realize that he she just created it on the copper plate. But um, it has a feeling of being a very hurried experience. However, I would think being hurried on an etching plate would not be so hurried. Is that true, Simon? <laughs> um, I can't say. I, I don't know enough to say, but I think what you mean, mean by hurried it, you, I think, and maybe another word would be agitated, agitated, and well, or, I think or, that's part. That's part of what she wants to convey. Uh huh. Well, okay. Um, what I noticed is that the major line strokes are all curved which would be necessitated by the human head and hand. Yes. The cross hatching varies enormously. The face emerges out of heavy bent lines and there's very little negative space. Good, good. That's the only thing that creates the lightness in the portrait. Good, good, excellent. excellent. The head without the hand would give an entirely different impression. Good. It would take away the exhaustion, the discouragement, the sadness. It would be someone looking at you, but the, it would be a totally different feeling without that hand. Excellent, excellent. And the, other, the interesting thing about the hand is that it's very big for the size of her head. Yes. And um, <clears throat> the hand in itself is extremely expressive. And yes. Then when you try to analyze how is it expressive? And it's just to me amazing that it's expressive by this very limited way of putting an image on 
on, uh, well, eventually paper, but on, on a copper plate. <clears throat> this is excellent. Uh, Lucy, absolutely excellent. Um, I, I, I want to say one thing and then I think we should go on. Uh, okay. um, uh, what I like about what you're doing here is what you're saying shows that you took a lot of time looking at this and thinking about it. And that's very much what I like. In other words, something is holding you here and you're really, really looking at it and thinking about it. And that comes through in what you're saying. So compliments. Thank you. Yeah, no, really compliments. Um, Dean, the next two. Oh, that's me. <laughs> How interesting. How interesting. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I just didn't know what to do when I saw her. So, no, 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 um, no, 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 no. This is great. You go. Uh, okay. I won't give a, a, the same information. I have some of the same information. I'll just avoid that. Okay. Uh, Kathy Carwitz, 1867, 1945, etchings, wood cuttings, and lithography. Oh, she was introduced to me by our friend Mickey Sweet upstairs. Um, and since then, I, I got lucky and I came across um, uh, a, a book of hers uh, uh, that shows uh, quite a wonderful exhibit of her work. And uh, ever since Mickey introduced me to her, I didn't really get it in the beginning, uh, but I kept looking at it and looking at it. And she's so strong. And of course, with Mickey's coaching up to me, um, I've since spent more time looking at her work and reading about her background, which, of course, impresses me a lot. Um, her moral and her social idealism informed her work and consequently inspires others like me. Both her grandfather and her father had strong influence on her, as we just heard, and her husband as well. And um, though she worked mainly in black and white, her work conveys blood and sweat in the subjects that she depicts. Well said, this, very well said. This, thank you. The first portrait is a self-portrait of her, uh, of her working. And uh, the whole picture indicates strength, but the face is not harsh, it's focused. The up and down darker strokes indicate something else, maybe anger, maybe determination. I can look at this picture over and over because I see something different every time. I see a woman who's on a mission to expose the plight of the poor and forgotten, but she's not an unfortunate person herself. She has a husband and children and a comfortable life. So I've grown to love the strength that she demonstrates in her drawings. It's physicality and emotionally strong. The strokes are big and they force us to imagine her, her work more thoroughly. She studied social drama of the day and often used a play as a springboard for creative ideas. Fundamentally, she was a dramatic, a, a dramatic artist who dealt with human emotions through gestures and facial expressions. That was particularly interesting to me coming from the theater as I do. So um, the second person- Could you say, say something about that? Say something more. Well, I mean, the fact that she read Ibsen and Zola and, and she did read a lot of literature uh, which in, informed her work. Well said, very well said. Um, and, a, and a book called Women, Past, Present, and Future was the beginning of her interest in social democracy and the women's movement. The women's movement in her day, I mean, that's really powerful. So, um, I mean, her whole, her whole way of living was, it was hard, but at the same time, she had the comfort of, of, a, of a, a loving home and family. And she wasn't poverty stricken the way a lot of the people that she drew were. Yeah. The second choice is an unknown woman. We don't know who she is or what role she plays in this collection of lost and forgotten people. What I see is unflinching realism and a study in expressing feelings. This woman seems spent. Maybe she's just tired. Her eyes are staring down her hand on her forehead, as we do when we're trying to think something through. The hands are almost always rely relaying something in her work. Hands come up a lot in her work. I have to imagine that this woman's story, what it is, because there are so many possibilities as to what it could be. Unlike the self-portrait, the strokes of this woman are different. They're not strong, the strokes are thin. 
the pencil line like her hair is her hair looks thin and the artist brings those strokes down across her face the face becomes darker her eyes almost disappear the hand across the forehead and one finger almost in the eye makes me feel a sense of exhaustion she's looking down as if in deep thought but because the strokes are so deliberate one eye is completely blocked out and her hand is holding her head up in a way that indicates that she's out of ideas as to what to do next. Finally, she doesn't look old. Her mouth and her skin look fairly young. So do her hands. Her hair is thin, but her forehead, the skin on her forehead is smooth. I would say that poverty depresses you. It, do it doesn't offer many options. It ages you emotionally, perhaps sooner than it does physically. If you look at the self-portraits and the portraits of her parents, which I have in this book that I bought, they look depleted, all of them. Nobody has a smile on their face. I mean, they just look as if they're, they're just done. They've, they've just been through hell and they have no more to give. And there's never a point where there, there, there's an indication of hope or victory in the people that she paints, including her family. But the artistic expression is incredibly powerful and worth examining. That's all. <laughs> well, I think, I think this this uh, image was when uh, was a self portrait because she didn't make any other self, any other portraits. That, no, she made no. a lot of portraits. I have a book here right here. No, she made a lot I, of portraits. She well, made a lot of portraits. The stuff it's, that I looked at. Said okay. Was a self all right. Okay. And she was forty three years old at the time when she made it. Uh -huh. okay. um, uh, two, two, two responses very quickly. <clears throat> it's very rare for artists to only work in black and white. And um, a, key, a key event occurred for Kulvitz where she, I think she either met or read uh, the, an artist named Max Klinger. And Max Klinger wrote a kind, an essay or a credo about the, the beauty of black and white. And um, she was very moved by that uh, essay that he, he had written. Max Klinger is mainly an etcher or drawer. And she basically kind of follow that direction. There are very few of her works that are in color. Um, most of, mostly is black and white. The second thing that I can think to say is that um, I used to admire a poet named James Wright and uh, I like his work very much. Then I realized that he had passed away I went to a memorial service for him at, um, I think, um, a Y in the 60s in Manhattan. There were a lot of people were there and uh, maybe about 10 or 12 people spoke. And the first or second speaker uh, read a poem of James Wright called A Blessing. And then the sixth or seventh speaker read the exact same poem. And then the very last person who spoke was um, Garrison Keeler. And he spoke about James Wright. I think he was a friend of his, he knew him well. And at the very end, he recited a blessing from memory. So it was curious to hear that same poem three times. Um, so I like, I like this. I like this a lot. Um, let's go to uh, the next one. Oh, that's mine, Alan. OK. OK. OK, so um, the two works I chose um, are Dog Woman that on the left by Paula Rigo, and that was done in 1994. And the other is Painter Working Reflection, which is obviously a painting by Lucian Freud, which 
was completed in 1993. So both were done around the same time. Um, both pictures struck me as being visceral, but not in the sense of being gut-wrenching, but more like dealing with crude or elemental emotions. Both artists are using a rough style with long strokes in order to express the drama and mood of their work. Well said. As I stare at each piece, I stare at each piece, I think of words that could possibly describe these pictures. For Paula Rigo's drawing, words such as grotesque, contorted, bestial, wild, loud, frustration, aggression, anger, and force come to mind. Excellent. I have long given up trying to understand what the artist is trying to say, which I find is incredibly difficult. So I am far more interested these days in what drawings and paintings mean to me and how they affect me emotionally. In Dog, Great. Woman, Great. In Dog Woman, I can hear a growl or a roar in my head. I can feel the force and power of the woman's massive thigh. Her eyes are focused upward at her quote unquote prey. I could imagine the pounce to come. The woman seems frustrated and possibly angry and certainly very aggressive. Yet there is an intimacy which brings you into her world to observe a transformation of sorts. Many of us have or know dogs. Rarely do we come across dogs with the temperament and expression of power of this nature. <laughs> but then she's not a dog, but a human being. She's something many of us feel it, which is suppressed by our culture. In Freud's self-portrait, he seems to be quite focused on his work. Words and phrases that come to mind are sculpted, <coughs> intense, strong, lost in thought, and in your face. He accents his aged muscles with long strokes and contrasting shading. He's exposing himself completely, but he does not seem at all vulnerable. He is here, but he is nevertheless emphasizing his muscles. He looks powerful, emotionally, if not physically. There is no sense of shame. He holds the palette knife and the palette like a sword and a shield. He's very confident, but I wonder if his posture and expression represent a patronizing attitude or his need to defend his art to the world at large. In my mind, where a dog woman is on the def offense, Freud could be on the defense. Both works are full of emotion and both are making a statement. Both emphasize strength. Both have backgrounds that have a lot of movement, which reinforces their atmospheres. Both pieces are incredibly intense. Seeing the two pieces together seemed like such a natural comparison. Super, super, really super. Um, Thank you. Yeah, really super. Um, one thing that strikes me, I don't know why I think this, but just to say it is that, um, <clears throat> you know, when you're trying to create paintings and drawings, um, you really try to get it right. It, you try to be better and better at getting it right. At, being sharper and sharper, more, more finesse, more finesse, more technical acuity. And um, I think that that's not really the issue. The issue is finding an aura, uh, a, a buzz, uh, a, uh, an intensity that um, uh, radiates off the art. And um, it's an interesting problem because you want it to be better, but on the other hand, you also want it to have this kind of energy. Um, does that make sense, Alan? Yes, no, definitely. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, let's go to the next one. That's a great choice, by the way, the two together. Uh, uh, Dean, the next one. That's me, Carol. <laughs> this is great. This is yeah. great. 
they're, they're kind of backwards because they talk about Clemens first. So the two paintings are Don Clemens' Table of Work and Francis Bacon's Studio. Um, Clement paints her studio table and shows what her studio is for by adding a wall painting or a drawing of the table, which shows how the objects on the table are transformed in her painting. Everything that is on or around the table ends up on the wall painting. We see not only her studio, but how she creates in her studio. We see the very exacting painting of the table itself, almost photographic, but then we have the wall painting, which is much more painterly. She's very organized about her work. She has laid out these objects, which seem to trigger her mind to do the painting that is on the wall, where the objects take less exacting forms. This is a very limited studio. There's no paints, palettes, easels, etc., And the painting is of the objects, not of her tools. The studi studio to her is only important for what it helps her create. Bacon, on the other hand, lays it all out. His studio is full of tools and paints and everything else, but it's incredibly hard to figure out how anyone could paint in there or even <laughs> stand in there. <laughs> it does, though, feel very freeing. He can do anything at all that comes to his mind in this studio. The painting itself is photographic. He's showing us exactly where and how he works. Mm. The room shows no restraint. Nothing is put away. There's no order. It is chaotic. I can imagine him painting almost in a fury, grabbing brushes and paints and tools and tossing them away when done. Yet this painting is an exact replica, which must have taken time and patience. And it is the opposite of his typical work. In most of his work, he is making chaos out of order. Here, he is making order out of chaos. The chaotic studio makes sense given his typical work, but the painting of the studio doesn't fit with that. Bacon, feel, Bacon feels free in his painting and Clements feels very controlled. And yet what Bacon has painted is very exacting and Clements much less so. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, but, that's but, very interesting. Um, Carol, do you, do you realize that the image on the left is a photograph? No. Yeah, the image on the left is a photograph. Uh, I'm sorry, I should have, I should have. Uh, no, it's not, it's not, I just wanted, to, you know, to make sure that you got that. No, well, that changes a little bit, but yeah. yeah. So there are a bunch of photographs that were taken of his studio. And yeah. the curious thing about this is that the rest of his house, where this was, was very neat. Hmm. Very neat and very um, um, orderly, almost fanatically orderly. And, um, but I like the juxtaposition of the, of the uh, two, of the two images. And um, um, yeah, I like well, that very much. Yeah. yeah. I almost chose these two images too. <laughs> Which is interesting. Uh, I didn't, I don't think that looks like a photograph. It's so interesting. Yeah. yeah it's a, definitely a photograph. And I think I described earlier about how um, I saw a film. A you said it was replicated, the studio, yeah. Yes, and this, this was in, um, I think in London, and they replicated this in Dublin. So if you go to Dublin, you could see this, where architects and archeologists plotted this out um, it, I don't know how they I don't know how they did it, but they plotted out all the garbage in here, all the detritus in here, and then they brought the whole thing to Dublin. Um, oh my God. Um, okay, so so let's see the next one. 
<laughs> All right, Dean. This is my selection. Um, this is uh, uh, Jenny Savile's drawing. I don't know what it's called on the left. Um, and then um, Helena Scarfback on the right. Um, I like something about drawings that give you a sense of the presence of the artist in the act of making the art. And that is behind the choice of the several multiple figure drawing and the gray um, Helena Scarfback self-portrait. They reminded me of when I used to draw on the composite desk material desktop of my fourth grade desk. A good part of the pleasure was the feeling of the graphite tip along the surface and just watching what appeared. Also something that comes to mind is the thought of cognitive dissonance, a topic that I've been thinking a lot about recently. And it is the force within that fights for a sense of authenticity. And I think of the artist um, uh, sort of, you know, in the act of creating this and feeling that tension uh, and trying to create something that has a feeling of realness. If I think that each person feels a sense of stress when confronted with information that contradicts their existing sense of reality or morality, what is true, I start to feel a reason behind unbeautiful art. I like the diving in these represent, the impulse not to wait for a better pose, a prettier moment or more facility or refinement. We are all temporarily abled. And while we have the ability, we might as well do all we can. Thus the scarf Beck uh, continuing to do self portraits as she um, continues into her eighties and um, you know, enjoying the uh, materiality, I guess, of what, what she can create of a, of a likeness. Um, we have two lives and the second begins when we realize we have only one. There's a quote that uh, is contributed to Confucius, and I like that statement. Uh, could you say that again? We have two lives. We have two lives, and the second begins when we realize we have only one. <laughs> terrific. Dean is terrific. Thank you. More? Oh, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I, there's a very interesting choice here. <clears throat> I would guess that the one on the left is like eight by nine feet. Yeah. And the one on the right, which I've seen, is probably eight by 10 inches. Um, yeah. And two women two very interesting and strong women, um, great examples of women pursuing their uh, art and life. And um, a really good choice, a really good choice together. The one on the right I saw in, um, in um, the hog, in a museum in Der Haag. And it, it was connected with about eight or nine or 10 other pictures, the same size, which show her aging at about the age of 80 to 82. You should try to look those up. Um, the last one might've been this one or another one. And it almost feels like the person is disappearing, disappearing. Um, very, very strong, very evocative. Um, and they these connect with the culvets, actually. Yeah. To me. Um, let's let's see the next one. You tell me what is Scharfbeck? Is that the name of the artist on the right? What her yes. name is? Yeah. Uh, Scharfbeck. Scharfbeck. Oh, sure. Sure. Okay. Do you have it, uh, Dean? The spelling? 
Yeah, the last uh, the last name is S C H J E R F B E C K. So her first name is Helene, H E L E N E, and mm -hmm. she's Finnish. <coughs> Finnish. Um, oh, she's Finnish. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Not Dutch. Finnish. Okay. Okay. Let's go on to the next one. <laughs> Who's of these? It's Francis. Oh, okay, good, good. Go it ahead. Also, Go ahead. It's interesting. Uh, so, I, uh, of course, one is it, it's uh, Dickinson, and of course, Kate Kowitz. So uh, everyone knows now. Uh, one is a painting, and one is drawing. They both use subdued colors. In the Kowitz. The clothing is hastily done in a different style from the hand and face with a rapid connection of the sleeve, conveying us from one to the other, just as an artist's hand and mind works between them, like the electricity, it, to me it conveys the electricity uh, of the nerves going uh, from hand there. And uh, in Dickinson, there's softness and tenderness to the clothing as well as to the face. And uh, what he didn't say about the Kowitz, uh, there's this rapidity in the sleeve and clothing, but the hand and face are drawn with softness and tenderness. So they're not only the likenesses of the artists, but they manage to convey thought processes, the look of concentration in each of them. Kowitz by the focus of her eyes on the work and her hand poised as if deciding which spare mark to make next. Dickinson, thank you. Dickinson also focused completely on the work with geometric figures behind him as if he is given very careful attention to the layout of the canvas in front of him, which clearly is done to the one we're looking at. And so I chose these two pictures, these two pieces that show each artist in deep contemplation of their work. I'm fascinated by their ability to share with us their multi-leveled involvement in their creations. This interests me because of my idea that what makes something a work of art, so you know, what is art, is the intentionality of what the artist wants to convey, as well as the facility to which it's executed using uh, Simon's term last week. I like that uh, differentiating between uh, Rockwell and Hopper about uh, the depth of meaning in the latter and the fine facility of the former. Uh, and not unlike the difference to me between a musician who has great technical ability alone as opposed to those who can convey their feelings through the music. Excellent. To me, uh, these artists show that they value what they do and they value how they spend their time. Um, I like the word intentionality. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to think about that. That's a very interesting word. Um, your choice of these two together is wonderful. Yeah. Oh, I just want to quote you on what you just said a few minutes back yeah. about the intensity that radiates off the art. I felt like that was better worded than my, what I was trying to say here, but is about the same idea. <laughs> That's not important, but um, what's interesting in the in the Dickinson is the close values of the colors, mm -hmm. and he, you he set up some kind of mirror arrangement. And I believe it feels to me like you're looking up at him. You're looking up at him and you see, uh, I believe it's a cube, a cube in perspective. And um, um, he's a very, very interesting artist and um, his drawings are incredibly good. And um, 
he his if you're interested in drawing he was a major league draftsman and um um you should look look up his drawings um the, so could we go on to the next one uh, unless you have, unless you have something more to say francis no that, that was what i had to say thank okay. you okay let's go uh, dean to the next person now i don't know if renee is here is renee here uh she'll come back next week she chose these two which curiously were the um the, the two pieces that I sent in my note to you. And mm. today she told me that um, something happened to her um, Google online account. And she was wondering if it had to do with the sexual images that were, were on her account. Uh. <laughs> it, would be, it would be nice to believe that art could shoot <laughs> Google. I would like to believe that oh, art my gosh. shortcut Google, uh, but well, well, we'll see. We'll see by next week what she says. Oh uh, God! The, ne <laughs> the next one. The next one after this. Uh, those are mine, Kathy. Um, okay, so I'll I'll read what I wrote here. Uh, the one on the left is Antonio Lopez Garcia. I love his work. And of course, Andrew Wyeth on the right. What attracted me to these two paintings was the ethereal quality of the light that was captured. To me, these paintings are less about the subject matter and more about painting the light. Light well, which envelops. Well, well said. Well said. Terrific. Thank you. And light which envelops and softens the forms. Light and its qualities, direction strength, and strength, I'm sorry, light and its qualities of temperature, direction and strength are of primary importance to an artist. And Wyeth and Lopez Garcia captured the light beautifully. There's only a hint of warm and cool colors in these high key, low chroma paintings, paintings that um, subtly, that its subtlety required great skill and restraint, which I admire. In doing a little research, I found two quotes by the artist. Uh, Lopez Garcia said, I believe that something else, the substance of your spirit, is incorporated in the work. The work is made to transmit emotion. The material with which you work is the objective world, but you incorporate some of your soul into the work, and that is art. And Wyatt said, terrific, um, terrific, terrific. Yeah, it was interesting, those quotes. And uh, then Wyatt said, it's a moment that I'm after, a fleeting moment, not a frozen moment. Both quotes are about the artists imparting life into their paintings. And I think both artists achieved that in their portrayal of light. Both paintings have a spiritual quality. Yeah, really, um, really terrific. Um, uh, have you ever seen Lopez's work in person? No, only reproductions. Okay, yeah. well, a few years ago, there was a uh, large exhibit of his work in Boston, oh. at the Boston Museum. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm gonna guess five years ago or seven years ago, something like that. But I've seen his work, I've seen his work many times um, for, for particular reasons and just, because I follow his work. Um, mm -hmm. And the part that you mentioned about light, I just want to address. So um, if you saw this painting on the left in person, mm -hmm. you would not sense the rendering. It would, at, if you looked at it up close, mm -hmm. it would start to come apart. Okay. To, to, um, mm -hmm. shake, to shake and vibrate. Mm -hmm. and it's not really rendered. It's like the light is fluttery. Mm. Interesting. And, and it's very hard to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it, it's um, kind of magical. So you, I agree totally 
that the painting is about light. Uh, I agree totally. And um, um, there aren't a lot of exhibits of his work, mm -hmm. but I've, I've traveled and seen it, exhibits in Madrid of, I went there purposefully to see his work. Okay. And uh, the, the light is really, really unusual. Mm. Um, um, let's do the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> That's me. Um, and it's a big contrast from the last couple. Um, <clears throat> But I, the paint, the painting on the left is um, of um, Jacob Lawrence. And in doing research, I actually found out that it is not a self-portrait. It was painted by his wife, Gwendolyn Knight Lawrence. Um, and that actually lent insight to me as I, as I, looked at it more, but um, I was immediately pulled into this painting in particular because of the qualities of light and color and texture. Um, and I was just so drawn to, to the face in this painting. And I was immediately struck by the depth that is shown in this Jacob Lawrence painting. And I, I, one thing that I found that I loved and that was also shocking is that when I looked more closely, um, his brown skin is portrayed using, I don't think that there's brown in there. Not that I can see with my eye, um, mm -hmm. greens and golds and blues and maybe purple. And I find it so beautiful that it seems to shimmer with brightness and oh. texture. And the more I looked at it, the more drawn in I was and the more detail that I noticed. Um, and an interesting thing I learned about Gwendolyn Knight Lawrence is that she was a dancer mm. and they were married for many, many years. And I, when I look at, she trained with the sculptor Augusta Savage along with Jacob Lawrence and that's where they met and they were married for a very long time and one of the things that I even though this is a still and it feels rich and full of movement to me because of the texture and the color and and that thinking about her as a dancer um, made me it made me look at it in a different way I agree. The he, yeah. yeah, the Giacometti painting, I was also <laughs> drawn to by the colors and I didn't realize until I put them side by side how close in color they actually are. And similarly, I felt like there is a brightness and a lightness and a depth of texture in the Giacometti painting and that the colors are not necessarily what my eyes first see and interpret. Um, and in an initial view, I see something very different than when I look more closely. And they're both so bright, yet they're portraying darkness. His suit is dark, Jacob Lawrence's skin is dark. And I, it is that there's that contrast to me really stood out. Um, and the subject matter also, I think there's a contrast between the to the Jacob Lawrence painting to me, especially since it wasn't a self-portrait. Um, I, it, to me, it exudes a great deal of love and affection. His, I imagine her looking at him and just being madly in love with him. Well because I, I think he exudes, it, it speaks, uh, there's a softness and a gentleness and peacefulness about, his look and she seems to have caught him in a pose of contemplation. And in contrast, Giacometti to me almost looks like he is um, so proud. I don't know much about him and I didn't research him but he looks so proud, almost like he's daring the viewer to watch him do his superior work. 
and I am the boss of my own um, studio here. And yet the color softens the emotion in that painting, even though the look on his face seems proud and uh, a bit harsh um, in drawing the viewer in to let's see what I can do. Um, so. Uh, that's, great. that's great. Uh, did, did I interrupt you? Did you want nope, to say more? That is it. Um, so Kristen caught a mistake that I made, which was that <laughs> I put in the painting on the left as by Jacob Lawrence. And um, so I don't usually make a mistake like this, but this was a mistake. <laughs> and you see, when you, when you look up images, a lot of times the images are cousins or distant relatives or friends of the artist. So you see a whole lot of images. And I thought, given my um, the predilection was to do self-portraits or the artist, I thought that this was um, Jacob Lawrence. Uh, and but it also indicates that I didn't really have a good knowledge of his work because after um, Kristen pointed this out to me, I looked to myself, of course, of course, this is not his work. It doesn't even look like his work. It just looks like him. <laughs> well, when I first looked at it, my thought was, it's so different from all of his other work. That's so fascinating. Yeah, so, I thought that too. I was yes. thinking, this doesn't look like his work. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So, so it's my it's my era. It took he, a while, to, a little while, to find her that she was the artist, actually. Yeah. So he he and his wife. Um, were um, a very handsome couple. And um, the Giacometti, uh, I would say that you can read about him, very, very smart man, very philosophical, um, very existential, and one of the few artists that drew painted and sculpted in the 20th century, in, in the whole 20th century. That's very unusual. Um, I did mention a book on uh, Giacometti that is very interesting called Posing for a Portrait of Giacometti. It's by a man named James Lord, and it's very short but I think it's one of the best books I've ever read on the creation of a work of art. So what James Lord did was he posed for Giacometti and at the end of each session, he took notes and wrote the notes down. And the, the book tracks the journey of this painting that Giacometti did. Um, okay, so, so um, let's see the next one. Good. Okay, this is uh, Sal. This is uh, mine. Um, okay, uh, I know we've been talking about some serious issues or, you know, describing people in places. Uh, this is not, for me, this is not that type of either of these paintings. Um, the first one is by uh, Raoul Dufay, and he was one of the Fauvists, uh, which was what. Uh, Matisse, uh, the movement that Matisse uh, was really the star of. Uh, and uh, Dufay was more, in the beginning, was one of his uh, pupils. Oh. So um, the, the big thing with the Fauvist was always color. That was at the top of the line. Color, color, you couldn't get enough of color. Uh, and light. Uh, the light exposed the color even more uh, exaggerated it. So Dufay was, his call was uh, to really uh, provide pleasure for his audience. Um, you see scenes on the left there of, um, looks like uh, ships or boats, 
I know he liked to do it, or he liked to take pictures of people uh, voting. Um, you see an easel there, uh, you know, which uh, I, I believe that's an easel which uh, he used. The, the big thing here on this painting was his technique. Now, normally you draw and then you paint. He did the opposite. He painted and then he drew. Now, what he did is he would take um, a wash, which is, I guess, a thin paint with uh, glaze, and he would use that. That would, that would be his, his initial stage. And you could see the, the pinks and the blues uh, and whatever, the reds. So that would cover, that would cover the, uh, you know, the, the board there. Um, then what he would do is then he would take a fine pen or a, a, a thin uh, a brush and create his objects. He would outline them. Um, on top of, of this wash that he had originally put down. So, um, yeah, I mean, you see the, the items, you know, are, are, uh, are lines, you know, that have, that have uh, been put in um, after the fact. So, um, and his perspective is uh, sort of flat. I mean, from what I, from what I could see, but you could see the light, those windows are sort of, I don't know if they're open, I think they're open, then the light would be flooded in, like I said, which would even make the colors uh, uh, more more exuberant. So, um, and there's fabric on the left side. He, he dealt with fabric. So the reddish part on the left side of the painting um, is the uh, is the fabric. So uh, again, my feeling, you know, I've seen several paintings by him, um, is that he really wanted to make people uh, happy. You know, to for them to experience uh, life in, in in all its best ways and all its charms and whatever. Um, the second painting is by Norman Rockwell. All right, now uh, Rockwell had gotten a commission. You know, he had worked on Fair Evening Post for I don't know thirty or forty years. Many covered uh, covers for that magazine. He got a commission, and and the way he worked is he was told. Uh, you know, by the head of the company or whatever. This is what I want. This is, you know, this is a uh, this is a holiday season to so put, you know, put a Thanksgiving dinner or a Santa Claus or whatever. So, you know, he would say, okay, you know, you know, no problem. He finally got a commission for he wanted the Fair Evening Post wanted to put him on the cover. This was in the latter part of his career. It was in 1960. So they wanted they wanted people to see, uh, you know, who is this guy? You know, uh, what does he look like? So uh, Rockwell, you know, he thought about it, you know, and uh, he felt, well, this is this is the way that I want to show myself, you know, um, as an artist. So he, his idea was this uh, triple portrait, which is what this is called, um, and. Um, it, it's set up in a way that's sort of, I don't say confusing, but you really have to keep your eye on the three, uh, the, two, the, the mirror image, the real image, and the uh, painting really at the same time and try to get a grasp you know, of uh, you know, what's going on right now. And also you see certain paraphernalia at the top. Uh, you see... Uh, an eagle and a, and a uh, it's like a flag. And obviously, uh, Rockwell was deeply patriotic. He dealt with a lot of paintings about World War II, and uh, he was for the common people. So that's a side of him, right? The people already knew about, right? Then at the top, there's a helmet, which was one of the props he'd use. He would use models for his pictures, right? And he would, you know, arrange them. This is what I want. I want you to look like this, et cetera, et cetera. So it was almost like a film director uh, working with actors for some of his, a lot of his uh, covers, his illustrations. Now, um, before he, before he asked this artist, uh, Rockwell, in the picture starts painting, he's got these small photos of other uh, portraits. Uh, I had Don Durr, Reverend, uh, Picasso, and uh, Van Gogh. So he's, he's like, Taking sort of an inspiration, or he's saying, "Well, you know, how did these, how did these other painters, you know, what did they do? How did they look at themselves? 
you know, uh, you know, on the side or, you know, uh, their facial expressions. And so uh, what, he, what he's decided to do here is he wants to take, take a self-portrait of himself, right? So um, at the same time, uh, Rockwell was very humorous in his illustrations. Uh, you know, you not only would see something on the front cover that you got to identify with, but you got to chuckle out of it, right? So uh, what he's doing here, and people, he didn't, he, it's sort of like an inside joke in a way, that there were two things happening here that people uh, might not realize or understand, right? Uh, well, one of these in, in, inside jokes, first of all, is, Who's in the mirror, right? It's, it's Rockwell, but Rockwell never wore glasses in real life. And not only is he wearing glasses, right? But they're opaque, they're covered. <laughs> so you don't see you don't see his eyes. So Rockwell said that the reason he did that was to make people believe that he couldn't really see himself well, and that his uh, portrait was a better expression of himself. And uh, Rockwell, you know, felt you know that he was very thin and he was not very handsome. He sort of wanted to uh, make him look better, right, on the cover. Again, people, you know, very few people probably knew what he looked like. So this was his uh, his chance to uh, make an impression with the public. So um, that's that's sort of like uh, a humor thing or, or an in-joke as to why he's doing what he's doing. Uh, the other thing is uh, look at the mirror, right, and look at the... Uh, portrait on the paper, right? Uh, it's not the same image. It's actually a mirror image. If you notice, Rockwell has his pipe originally to, to his left, to his left side. Now the portrait has it looking as if it's to his right side. And again, it's because of mirror images. So uh, again, he's throwing something in that, uh, you know, again, would, you know, make people maybe chuckle a little bit or you know, say, what well, you know, this guy, you know, this guy is really smart if he would think about something like this. Now, there's also um, a wastebasket at the bottom right. Now, there was a big fire earlier in Rockwell's career where a fire destroyed uh, a lot of his work, his work, his paintings, his illustrations, and a lot of props that he used. And the cause of it was that he, he uh, as you can see, he smoked a pipe all the time. In fact, he, uh, died because of emphysema. So what happened is there were there were wet rags in his basket and he turpentine or whatever, solvent, and uh, epson minorly, he just, you know, put out ashes out on the, uh, uh, in this, in this uh, basket. And uh, so, you know, he's sort of saying, well, you know, um, I, I'm, you know, I'm trying to tell you or show you like what you know what uh, what happened. You know, just as this is for like information, like maybe people didn't know uh, how this fire had occurred. It was sort of like a, uh, a subject that was not explained too well because people didn't want to know that he had, uh, you know, he'd been the perpetrator himself. Um, uh, so, uh, of the fire. Could I could I just break in just for a second? And I think yeah. I think we should go on, but. I, I like the choice of these two together. I think they work well together. And um, uh, obviously Rockwell was a crackerjack drawer and a crackerjack illustrator and a crackerjack artist, um, it, clearly. Um, and this is so clever and so enticing. Um, uh, I, I'm just breaking in because um, uh, I think you've exceeded the five minutes or six minutes or whatever. <laughs> I want I want everyone to get a get a chance. But what you said is is a absolutely excellent. A excellent. Um, let's go on to the next person. Uh, mm. uh, that's me. Hi, it's David. Um, so, so I'll get right into it, but um, uh, with my little, my little essay lit. Um, I love looking at pictures of people and feeling a human connection across time, place, culture. Sometimes my focus is squarely on the subject, 
which can be vivid, lifelike, or realistic, or can be heavily distorted or concealed. Other times I feel the connection to the creator um, what the, in what the artist chose to show me and what the artist chose not to show me in the texture and physicality of the work in a sense of the act of creation. Today, I wanna to talk about guardedness and um, how guardedness and intentional non-self revelation can be a powerful trait in an image. I see this in different ways in the two images I selected for today. The first is a tightly cropped self portrait of a young Harvey Dinnerstein that is image 50 in the Dropbox. The second is the seated nude self-portrait by an elderly Alice Neal that is image 59. First, the Harvey Dinnerstein work. It is tightly focused, just Dinnerstein's face framed by a billed cap, his sinewy neck and his upper chest, clavicles and sloping shoulders bared in a sleeveless green undershirt. The composition is vertical, symmetrical, metered by horizontal lines of a paneled or siding wood wall behind the artist uh, with the top of the head cut off and the canvas almost fully occupied by Dinnerstein's figure. Dinnerstein isn't doing anything. He's not holding a brush, making as if to paint, and he isn't surrounded by tools of his craft or other signifiers, sorry about my dog, except his limited clothes, the cap, <laughs> the shirt, and his round glasses. The setting doesn't reveal much either. Um, the skin's blotches and freckles are frankly depicted and the palette is tinged with hints of green and sickly lit. The image is slightly blurry to me. I trust intentionally as if to invite the viewer to inject their imagination and to project um, what Dinnerstein is thinking, who he is, what he is like. The inscrutability breeds curiosity and projection of possibilities. Uh, the lack of external reference and easily readable emotion or action also demands that I focus on Dinnerstein himself. I see a young man with big ears, simply posed, not looking like he wants to engage with me, not telling me a narrative through culturally signifying information I don't get from looking directly at him. He looks serious. He doesn't look extraordinary, nor all that distinctive. Maybe he is universal. Here I am, he says, make of me what you will. I see a person who looks thoughtful, serious, somewhat vulnerable in that he lays himself bare without props, yet somewhat guarded through his impassivity. Uh, he isn't telling me what to think by spooning me detailed instructions through his work. He obviously thinks hard about what it means to be human and how to show that through his art. By doing it without spelling out the answers, he makes me think about that too how lucky I am to be encouraged through art to ponder existence, creation, the essence of being human. All this by creating a tightly cropped signifier light, emotionally guarded yet suggestive self image. Wow. And my second image is the Alice Neal. At first I thought, wow, this woman is just totally great, comfortable with herself saying, here I am and this is me and you damn well better get used to it. And that is totally powerful at risk of mansplaining. Um, have you heard that sometimes women haven't been taken seriously or given agency uh, and old people too, and maybe old female people even more through some strange multiplier effect. Neil has got an old person's sags, yes. And those are usually either missing completely from the cultural eye or cloaked or relegated to the background. Here it's front and center and she owns it. And I see celebration and power. I also see defiance in her strong grasp of a brush and her frank resoluteness, a big F you in a way. But I also see some guardedness at work here too. Look at her face. She's got a downward turned mouth, not a frown, but not a smile. She gazes at us with her old looking blue eyes below arched brow, watchful, perhaps where, wary, not warm and welcoming. Even naked, she's making herself, she is not making herself vulnerable or open to us. Rather, she has power and smarts and agency and a degree of mistrust. Of course, I'm projecting again, but I think that's because her work invites it. Actually, it insists on it. And I love what I see. It is a great compliment to say someone is comfortable in her own skin. And by God, this she is. I see someone who's lived in the world, is smart and a keen observer, has a zest for life, 
has seen hardship and cruelty and injustice, knows enough not to be like a trusting and open puppy, but is powerful and dares to really live. We should all be so brave and so lucky. Trent. <laughs> uh, well yeah. done, David. David. Well done. Hmm. It just one, one, just go back a bit. Yeah, that one. The one on the left, I don't believe it. The one on the left is four inches high. Four inches high. So wow. we're talking about. Um, That's uh, amazing. Four inches. Um, I can't. I can't even figure out how to get my hand onto the screen. But four inches high um, is. It's it's less than the width of your cell phone. So that's quite something. Um, let's see the next one, the next group. So these are mine um, th that okay. I chose. And I was trying to. This is Victoria here. Yeah. Go ahead. I was trying to stick with the theme of the artist in the studio. Um, I realized in looking at the pictures, and obviously, I mean, you had done this too, is that the studio is like an extension of the artist. So it is kind of like a wider self-portrait, if you will. Um, anyway, I, I was looking at what I wrote about this, and I don't know if I like what I wrote, so I'm just going to talk. <laughs> um, so the Felix Nussbaum, which is the one on the left. Um, well, first of all, let me just say that both of these portraits seem full of um, ego. And I don't mean ego necessarily in a bad way, but they're just so preciously self-aware. And that's what I mean by ego. Um, because they're both, you know, um, Saul, I think, I think it was Saul, was saying this about um, Rockwell, you know, it was kind of like a painting of a painter doing a painting of themselves, you know, sort of like that level of sort of just self-involvement, um, which is interesting to think about. And also the idea of the artist observing themselves, but also being the actor and observing themselves. Well um, said. Well said. You know, so those two sides of creating art. Um, now that, and somebody else said, I think it was Alan who said that he stopped trying to figure out what the artists were trying to say and just was wanting to talk about his own reaction to the paintings. And so I think I've chosen for your classes not to do research on the artists until after I've kind of decided what I think. <laughs> But I don't want to be influenced by what other people are thinking or by their lives or whatever. Um, good point. Good, very good point. Um, but the painting on the left, Newsbump's painting, has a real sinister quality to it, um, both from the mask and the shadow. And also, he has kind of this, what I had described in my essay as a maniacal expression on his face. And so you really wonder what he's doing. You know, it does bring that up. What's he doing? Because he's not a particularly good looking man. And yet he's showing himself, you know, unclothed in a very, um, well, what do you think of me kind of <laughs> posture, you know? Um, and, but also this kind of sinister posture. So it feels a little threatening to me also. Um, and I'm not sure I would want to run into him on a dark street. <laughs> um, but anyway, so that's my initial impressions of that. And then the impressions of Rockwell. And now I have a little bit more background on this. Before I, before I had that, I was looking at especially the contrast of the glasses in the mirror and no glasses on the canvas. And I thought, oh, he's so vain, you know, he's taking his glasses off for his portrait, but also that the glasses in the mirror are, you know, you can't see through them, they're opaque. And so then the question, you know, the Hamlet question of, 
to see or not to see, you know, sort of <laughs> variation on that. Um, well, you done. know, it raises that idea. Um, but also the ego is involved here because he's tapped up these other portraits of famous artists on his canvas. And it's like, is he trying to convey to the people who are viewing this? Well, I'm like them. Can't you see that? <laughs> you know? um, so that was just a sort of interesting concept. Um, so it just had me thinking a lot about how to be an artist kind of out there in the world and to show your work really requires a large degree of self-confidence um, and that these what I, I'm not even sure what I'm trying to say here but the the larger than life feelings of having something to contribute to society I think come across in these self-portraits um Anyway, so that's more or less what I wanted to say. Yeah, that's very good. Uh, honestly, Victoria, um, <clears throat> someone asked a question about, um, I can't remember who asked this, but about um, Felix Nussbaum, about how his work survived. <clears throat> I did. I, I looked very briefly at the book <clears throat> that I described, and I have a little bit of an answer. One is that he, he had a doctor friend in Belgium, in Brussels, and he wrote to this person and told him that he wanted him to take care of his paintings if something should happen. Um, <clears throat> so that's the first thing. The second thing is that his paintings have been kind of just discovered and they went through, a, I think three, four or five discovery stages where some of his paintings were on exhibit and then it reminded someone that they had seen other paintings of his and they brought them forward. So that's, that's one thing. Um, I liked what you said about ego as being self-aware. Because ego is a curious word because ego could be um, puffed up mm -hmm. or um, self-driven. But um, self-aware has a different connotation and um, it's just one of those words that um, has a range of response to. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I, 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 I think, how many more left, um, Dean? Like three or four? Oh, was, no, that's my cat. That's the cat. <laughs> how many more, Dean, how many more are left? Oh, this one, this one, this one. Yeah. Uh, John, are you here now? Yes, I am. Why don't we end with you doing this one? I knew, I did not know these two paintings before I took this class. Why didn't you hear? We didn't hear that. It's hard to hear. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. much better, much better. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. You know what? I had the paper on top of my... Um, computer, and that was muffling it. So I didn't know these two painters, uh, and I was struck by their works, and I think there, there's a lot of interesting things to talk about with, with both of them. I'm just going to read my essay. Um, George Tooker, and that's the slide on the left, which is called, I'm sorry, I'm going to start with Tooker, which is the slide on the right. Okay. So um, uh, let me, let me just interrupt. If, if you haven't gone tonight, then we'll start with you next time. Okay. The, I, I haven't forgotten, but I actually had some interchange today with John about this group. And um, it was interesting batting this around. And so it's fresh in my head. John, continue. 
Sure. So one cannot approach George Tooker's painting, The Voice, the one on the right, without feeling a sense of alarm. The emotional quality of the painting seems to me to be one of lurking danger and unease. The vacant, haunted expression on the face of the character on the right of the door contrasts with the pleading, desperate eyes of the character on the left. The man on the left is in darkness with the bright cold light from inside the door just touching his face and giving it an orange flat glow as if standing near a fire. Inside man is bathed in a light so cold that almost all color is drained into a sickly yellow green except the blue of his eyes and their large black pupils. The desaturated palette creates an eerie unnatural sensation. Well, inside, so it, mm. Inside man's hand pushes against the door, feebly with no strength. He knows that the person knocking must come in eventually, but he is caught at the moment of his deep distress at this predicament. Well said. The mouth, thank you. The mouth of the outsider is agape, the eyes seeking contact with whoever is behind the door. The painting is called the voice, so we can discern that there is a sound coming from that mouth and the prominent ear of the insider is hearing something hard to reconcile. An unwelcome but undeniable voice. Is it coming from within? Is this a painting of a dream? Is the man outside the door his own fear of something inside himself? It certainly looks the same, like the same person in a different light at a different emotional state. Well, is, so it, is it death? Could, is I, could I just interrupt for a tiny second? I think this painting would go under the category of very clear and very unclear. Okay. You should continue, continue. Um, the lines of the painting are unnatural and they add to the dreamlike quality of the painting. Even the inside man's coat is carved out of lines that make it so rigid, rigid as to seem like an elegant straitjacket made out of thin wood. The attention to detail throughout the work is compelling bringing your eyes to the, to the texture of his suit, the shade of his curved cheekbone, the black line of his slightly open mouth with the quilt-like pattern of his cropped hair. The fingers are so painstakingly exact that his nails look finely manicured, pale and corpse-like. If the man inside looks so shocked he might die, the outside man looks like death itself. One is reminded of the faces of men in concentration camps wearing filthy prison garb and staring pleadingly out into space, unable to describe what they have seen. His hand touches the door just opposite to his alter ego inside. They are two inches from each other, a world apart, and they are somehow inextricably bound together. This is a dark and mysterious Really well written. Really Thank, well you. written. <laughs> Thank you. This is a dark and mysterious wow. painting done in a bright light. And I find it hard not to keep staring at it and wondering what is going on here. Okay, so in contrast, the Dick Kett painting on the other, on the left-hand side, I, I wanna first say that this painting reminds me of the work of another artist, my son, Will. Um, and I chose it for that reason and also because of the contrast with the one on the right. It depicts an artist looking directly and honestly to the viewer. <laughs> holding in his hand an empty glass jar or vase. I love the disheveled shirt, unbuttoned and lovingly painted with so much detail to, to the folds and the play of light. The interplay of the glass jar and the light from the shirt, along with the fingers loosely holding the jar, suggest that he is in mid motion, possibly setting up a still life on a tabletop on the tabletop in front of him. The textures of the various objects are lovingly painted the bowl metallic with light hitting it from the direction of the viewer, the dark bottle precariously perched at the edge near the artist with its porcelain top in place and the glass jar about to be added to the composition. The face of the artist is open and very much enjoying his moment of concentration. What he, what he sees is what he wants to paint and this makes him happy. Uh, and that's why I like this, there's a sort of um, joy the line in the right side of the painting strikes me as a curtain from behind which he's sta staring out, perhaps into a mirror that reflects him and is soon to be a still life. Um, Something about the depiction of his face and eyes seems childlike, although he's very fully a man. 
The attention to light in his face is masterful. Mm. The shading of the hat in his face makes one think of noir photographs of movie stars oh, in the 40s. Mm -hmm. The painting of the cup of coffee or tea on the wall behind him blends into the wall as if the whole background is one painting of a painting on a wall. Its wood frame raised and lightened so as to give structure and depth to the artist's contour. This is a moment of inspiration and hopefulness. It's an homage to the act of creation and the fun and mischief of the painter. Um, it is one, it is one, okay, that's the end. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, there's another page somewhere. Anyway, that, that gives you the gist of it. And, and it, I, I love the fact that his hand is in motion. He's, he's doing something that he's completely engaged in. And it, it feels like it's, it's the moment he lives for in a funny way to me. Um, and as I said, it also reminds me of my son's painting. My son did a painting with a very similar composition in which his hands are very important. I thought these, these were two examples of hands being used. Somebody said in an earlier um, essay that the hands really were the most expressive part of that painting. And in this case, the hands are, are doing a lot of the work. Um, and, and that was true, true in my son's painting, which was also a very joyous artist at his at his desk with his stuff near him. Dean, Dean, do you have that painting? I'm sorry, I, I forgot to put it in the slideshow. Um, oh, oh, I wonder. No, that's all right. We'll do it. We'll, we'll show it next time. We'll show it next time. Dean. Okay. Okay. All right. uh, I, so, I don't know if so, you can see the, the people. Oh, yeah. There it oh, is. Yes, yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. And that's my son, Will. And you can see um, the same. Hold it, up. Hold it up again. The same texture and the love to the clothing, like his shirt. He has the same sort of light bouncing off it. His yeah. hands are poised about to, to do move something around. And that's his studio. You can't see it. But there's a picture in the background on the wall, just like in that other one. And Will's face here is very sublime. He's very, very it's a joyous moment um, and this is hanging in our dining room. So it made me feel very happy to see. And thank you. Thank you for showing it, Simon. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, no, uh, I plan to do that. Um, um, what I like in what you did was how carefully and slowly you looked at the two paintings. And that's what I'm trying to encourage that if you see something that you respond to, that it has layers and layers of looking, and that's a lot of fun and a, very interesting to do. Um, great contributions tonight. And um, please remember to send me the two images of Diane Arbus um, and to write on her. And we will continue next week with that starting with the essays that were missing tonight. Um, what, do you, what do you mean uh, about Diane Arbus? Are we supposed to have received something? Uh, well, the next assignment was to write about two images of Diane Arbus. For people, oh. for people who lived in New York, um, there was this exhibit on where they could go and see it, but you could find the same images online online. So to select two of them okay. and, and kind of convey your response to the two. Okay. Just like you did, just like you did today, just the okay. same. Um, and, um, and I, I still, I, I just take two minutes to just say this, the conversation with Kristen reverberates to me. I, Kristen, are you still there? Yes. Oh, yep. the conversation with Chris <clears throat> reverberates about um, joy and about, well, I think that Saul used a word in his communications with me in which he said, um, maybe the right word isn't joy, but purpose, purpose. Mm -hmm. And, um, but still, it's a very interesting conversation because um, the many of these pictures don't exactly look joyful to me, but yet 
yet they certainly seem to convey purpose and journey. And maybe as human beings, that's, that's a better goal than joy. I don't know, I don't know. But in our conversation, um, um, Kristen said something to me and I wrote back to her and I said, I was smiling from ear to ear. And she wrote back to me and she said, don't smile too much. <laughs> <laughs> very sharp, very sharp. See you next week. Okay. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Simon. Thank One you. Yeah. Okay. Good night. Bye. Bye, everybody. Go oh, away. Dean, just hang in for a second, Dean. All right.